Good afternoon, and well, welcome to the Graybeard Talks Geospatial. This is Bruce Buxton. You can see I'm joined by a special guest today. Um, it's a it's a beautiful day here in Pennsylvania. Ice is coming down, land you know, covering our four inches of new snow, and it's great to be inside and doing a live stream. Tim, how are you doing? Doing fantastic. I'm uh, glad to be warm too. Yeah, what's been going on? after being what's going on here in Texas, I was out of power for about two days. It's yeah, nice to, have, it's nice to have light. You and I have talked, so we know what's going on. Maybe you can inform the listeners, you know, what what's going on, where you are. <laughs> well, I'm in the uh, Dallas Fort Worth area, and uh, you know, so we had all the storms that came through. I didn't realize it was national news because we didn't have power, so I couldn't watch anything. But uh, our power went out at 9 a.m. Uh, on Monday, and we didn't get it back till uh, 4 a.m. yesterday. So. Uh, uh, we had to go find a hotel. We actually slept. I thought it'd be like camping, you know, like, oh, it'd be nice. We'll cozy up. I've never been so cold in my life. So <laughs> we had, and, but the thing about hotels around here was that's what everyone else was doing too. So there was, I think, over a million people that didn't have power in Texas uh, and we were one of them. So, uh, but it's nice to have it back. Well, good, good. And you're now you're I can back. really appreciate, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I'm calling my phone company, just thanking them for making sure the lights turn back on there. Yeah, that, it, it's nice to be back home, though. I think you were, you were just telling me that it's a great feeling to walk into your home and the, the heat's been yeah. on and it feels good, huh? Exactly, yeah. All the things you take for granted now, you're like, oh, man, I'm going to... Yeah. <laughs> the the only thing about this, this is, this is nice. Yeah, it, you know what? I just was thinking about this a minute ago. The only thing, the only problem with the time that we're doing this live stream today is that this is the, the landing of the Perseverance on Mars, <laughs> and they're live streaming it on YouTube. I could, I could, uh, I tried. To, I, I pulled myself away from the live stream to be able to talk to you. So hopefully, I'll be uh, recording on YouTube that we can watch Perseverance. Right. Through. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Neat, neat stuff, actually. Really neat Love stuff. It. So Love hey, before we get going today, um, I want to just say to the to those who are listening in who joined us, thank you for coming and thanks for listening in again. Um, I would appreciate it if you tell your friends about the live stream. We're doing it every Thursday, uh, 4 Eastern, uh, 1 Pacific, topics on uh, GIS and GIS integration, geospatial topics of all kinds. Um, I'm joined by Tim today because Tim is uh, a recognized kind of influencer in that space. Um, you know, you put yourself out there, Tim, um, yeah. especially, especially on LinkedIn. Try to use the platform to do a lot of networking and professional development. And so a lot of our discussion today is going to be talking about that uh, type of thing, about, you know, what you're doing in, in that in that realm. Um, so um, I want to just mention to the listeners, too, to those, please, I, I won't have any visibility into where you're, who you are and what you're, and, and who's listening, who's watching, unless you put something in the chat. So please put something in the chat so I know you're live and we can see who's out there and who's watching. Um, so Tim, uh, really quickly, just summarize, just tell, tell me who, tell me what you do, who you work for and what your connection to GIS is. Okay. Well, I'm a, a, a long time, uh, local govy. I've worked uh, for Collin County for, I'm afraid to say, you know, 29 years or going on 29 years. It seems like a long time, but it's been a, an adventure every day. I've well, enjoyed hey, before, before we go on there, let's just stop right there because in one of our back and forths, you you had said something that maybe we should have a, a great uh, a uh, a beard maintenance uh, class, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or something so like beard so, maintenance tips. Yeah, I condition yeah, you, every day, so uh, you I mean, are you and I are definitely in the gray beard um, yeah. part phase of our careers and phase of life, and so it's really it's good to welcome a true gray beard. Anyway, so ah, thank you. No. I'm sorry that I, I interrupted <laughs> you on that. Go ahead and continue on your. Oh on your yeah. Journey. Clearly, my beard was not gray when I started, but uh, uh, even going a little farther back, I, I became a geography student, and, uh, and I'll tell you a quick little story about my dad. Uh, he got, uh, I, I, I took my first geography class and loved it. This has got to be it. This is something I want to do, and I wanted to embrace it, so I quit my job waiting tables at a local Italian restaurant, and my dad yelled at me for it. He's like, why on earth would you quit a good paying job like that you know, to go after this geography thing? <laughs> and uh, and I happened to take the very first class the University of North Texas ever taught in GIS, and that's when the light bulb went off. I'm like, oh my gosh, I think I could get a job 
with a geography degree. You know, I think this is something I can do. And I loved it. And uh, I, uh, I had my first job, which was, you know, it's, in fact, it's my Twitter moniker. It's uh, uh, the plot boy. And, uh, and for those of us with gray beards and, uh, and maybe a little grayer hair or that have been around for a while, the first plotters before they had these nice ink jets they have these days were pen plotters. And my job was to basically make sure the black ink didn't run out of the pen plot. It only had four pens and it would draw around. So my job was just to stop the printer, change the pen and put it back in. And I thought, well, this is probably not what I want to do for the rest of my life. And Collin County uh, had a position open and they wanted five years, five years experience uh, in GIS. And I had four months as the plot boy, but I applied anyway. So that, that that's advice I'm giving you right now. Go for it, right? Apply for the job, even if you don't think you're qualified for it. Because certainly I was not. Uh, and they hired me. Uh, yeah. And it wasn't it wasn't until I worked there five years that I finally went to my boss. And I go, you know, I now finally have the qualifications of the job I've had for five years. I finally now have five years experience <laughs> in the position because oh, I wanted to hire you the whole time. So, uh, uh, and then we've done, I, so I guess through the years, uh, I started off as, you know, I basically unboxed GIS. Uh, we had uh, RIS 6000, it was Unix box. We had ARC Info 5.1, 5.1 is when we started. So uh, uh, we've gone a long way. And, uh, and since then, I became, I got promoted, I suppose. Now I'm the applications manager. So I have the GIS group with me, but yeah. I also have records management, which I thought was weird when it happened, uh, and application development. And, uh, but, but records, you know, uh, where I used to think it was just a warehouse full of boxes, it's actually the most ripe to be automated, right? You, we can digitize all those things. It's all public record, and we can kind of turn it over to our citizens. So. That's been some of the most rewarding stuff we've done. Is, and really, uh, kind of record stuff. And really, one of the primary functions of county government, really, when you look at it, is to right. keep those records and to make sure those records are relevant. You know, and, and that's probably where that where the spatial aspect comes in because there's so so much of what the county has to do in the work has to do with where things are. Yep, absolutely. I mean, you know, I mean, a lot. I mean, I know a lot of cities do this. We we've, we've done this, uh, you know, for some of our building permits and things like that. So, I mean, it, and what I've learned, you know, was learning that things are spatial in nature, right? I mean, I, I hear this quote all the time. I don't know where the site is, but you know, all, all eighty percent of all data is, you know, spatial or has location. I, I agree with that, but. I'm still finding myself after all these years still telling people that, you know, like, you know, these permits have a location, right? I mean, you know, these, you know, where these, uh, where your road development is, you know, where, you know, it's still, you know, often in our places, people are working off spreadsheets and things like that, where you know, it's, it's made very easy when you introduce GIS to some of these departments are like, oh my gosh, this is so much easier. It makes so much more sense now. And, uh, and that's what makes my job so fun is because there's still, we're still teaching folks about this, even after all this. Amazing, isn't it? You unboxed yeah. unboxed GIS 25 years ago, and here you are still touting the value of of, right. of, of GIS throughout the county organization. I, I I stalked you a little bit on LinkedIn, and I, I I saw your headline. And those of you who who are using LinkedIn, you know that the headline is really important because every time that you comment or you put yourself out there, your headline, you, your picture and your headline are the two things that show up. So Tim's headline says, blurring the lines among applications development, records management, and GIS. And when I read that, what I hear is, here's someone that understands the role that uh, spatial or the location plays in all of those different areas. Like, do you have any examples in your work of how you've been able to say, I'm going to take my spatial orientation I have and I'm going to apply it to a traditional problem that we have at the county. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, when we do, uh, again, this is kind of pre-COVID, but we used to go and have advocate meetings. So there'd be a, a core group of senior management that would go talk to different uh, departments throughout the county. It kind of like help us help you kind of thing. Yeah. And one thing that I kind of picked up on, and that why I say blurring the lines, is I don't want people to think anymore that, oh, that's a GIS problem, or that's something the app dev needs to do. It's it's all of it. You know, it's the whole applications. It's more of a solution. So now when we talk to folks, 
you know, they, you know, they don't have to know what GIS is. They just know, boy, it'd be nice if I had something to do, you know, as they describe what their problem is. So I'll, I'll give you the, the uh, one example was um, uh, uh, our, our adult probation. They used to go out with those, maybe the wheel, there was like a wheel, like a big wheel that you would walk. It would be like a, a distance, measuring the distance. As an old, and, as an old paving contractor, I, yeah. we used to use those to come up with our pay when we want, we needed to get paid by the linear foot. So <laughs> Yeah. Make a couple of circles. Say, oh, I got you. Uh, no, well, this person would have to get a security detail, and then she would take that wheel and drive. You know, like walk it, because if, if you had to place somebody that uh, was that, that, let's say they were a sexual predator, well, they couldn't be. You know, and that's people we deal with in, in local government because it's all courts related stuff. Well, they can't be within a thousand feet of a of a school or a church or places where children congregate. So she would wheel that thing out and it would take hours. And she kind of asked you like, is there any better way? Like, of course there's a better way to do that. <laughs> yeah. How long have you been doing this? And we were able to make these, in fact, it was, we made the maps for her pretty quickly. And then we just said, here, you do it. You can make it as often as you want. And we gave her kind of a web app where she can build it herself. And that right. was just one of those, like, I can't believe I've been doing this all this year. And, and, and you can actually put, like now that you don't have the security detail, that's money saved. You know, how many hours it takes that you can now do in seconds, that's money saved. You know, so those are ways that you can kind of show this sort of return on this investment. But yeah, I thought that was the most brazen uh, example of, you know, why, how we can use this kind of thing. And it was just, it was as a result of one of those meetings, getting out of your office and going talking to those that, that need help. And they may not even realize you could do a thing like this until you talk to them. Because they'll never know. That's been our biggest issue. This, you know, at least in GIS, this has been my full experience. All of my experiences, nobody knows what we do, so they don't know to ask us to do challenging work. So it's up to me and you, Bruce, and, and whoever's watching. You need to go out there and tell them what you're capable of doing and prove it to them as a solution uh, instead of waiting for them to tell you. Because all they're going to tell you to do is make a map or something. And you've got to be able to say that you can do a lot more. Right, they're they're going to want you to print them off a map so that they can use all the traditional ways that they deal with a paper map to do their job, right? But you can say, well, this isn't just a map, right? So right. there's there's data, there's digital things here that live underneath this map, and we can use that data to solve problems in an automated way, right? I mean, the, there, I have two immediate examples right now. So a, a year ago, probably right about now, about this time you know, we all had to respond to COVID. And we, you know, we did our, you know, proverbial dashboard like everyone else, we were kind of feeding, but because we had application development as part of my group, we had this full, you know, this, uh, you know, we had to figure out how to capture, we had to build basically a COVID case management system. Okay. And part of that was, well, where are they? I mean, are they in Collin County or are they in a city? Because then once you started doing dashboards, well, our cities wanted to know how many cases do I have inside my city? So we had to build in a, a geocoding effort inside the application. So then we can show where you could click your city and see the cases that you have within your city. Uh, also, you can see the entire cases of the county. Yeah, um, and you know, we talked about this yesterday. I think this is fascinating because normally when we talk about geo-enabling a process, a business process of some kind, the, that's kind of code for I'm going to put a map in this somehow, mm -hmm. put a map in this. But in that instance, you're talking about being able to do these geo processes behind the scene right. that the the map never even shows up essentially. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's the and that is the case where we you know we had to pivot now to vaccines. You know we're we're struggling, and I imagine it's all over the country uh, that. You know, we have a lot of demand for people that want the vaccine, the COVID vaccine, but there's not enough vaccines to give. So one of the things we decided to do really at, at the beginning of January is build a wait list, you know, and let people sign up. And, uh, and part of that was now we have city partners that work, that they're working off our wait list. So the county has this master wait list that we give McKinney or Al or, uh, or Wiley or some of the, our, you know, even some of the hospitals, they scrape from our list. You know, so it's kind of like a line wait, like a butcher, you know, if I'm waiting in line, you know, with my number, but we have these folks in order. And it was really important to do this. Our app dev team was real strong with this, but we also had to add that spatial component. 
because Plano wanted to reach out to their citizens saying that the vaccine is coming. So give me everyone on your list that lives in Plano, not just the zip code of Plano or various zip codes of Plano, but the, are they in or are they out? And, uh, and so that's just part of what it is that we do. And you're right, Bruce, that didn't, that, there was no map required here. It was just something that was uh, easily, you know, that we can easily do that uh, now it just becomes so common. It's not, uh, they don't have to ask for it. It's just, we know to build it in because somebody will ask for it. Well, and that, and that kind of goes back to your point originally is that, that everybody thinks what you do is you print maps off. And so if, if you can explain to someone else, it's, it's more than just the map. It is the map in, in a lot of ways that can be the map, you know, but, but it's more than the map. If you can explain that, then maybe the lights go on there. You have a lot of, uh, when I listen to you talk about these things, I think you're like me and that you get really excited about solutions <laughs> that location. Like when I start talking to my customers about how location is a factor in their decision-making, you get so excited about it. Um, do you find that um, you're, the lo- you're kind of the lone voice in your county or have you been able to inject that location enthusiasm to other people, you know, not maybe not even GIS people, but people throughout the county. Have you been a successful doing that? Yes. Okay. I, I will say yes. I've been successful doing that, but I think it's because of my longevity. You know, over time, this has happened. You know, uh, and what, what's really what's really beautiful about working at a place for a long time is you see you see it growing. You know, so I, I, met, I like I worked with the adult probation folks. Well, now the DA saw what we did for the, the adult probation, like, well, I want something like that. And they would, they would ask, you know, that we would have to solve their problem. Like one of their problems is they want to know which city has the most caseload. Well, give us all your data and we'll, we'll tell you. I mean, it's, it's that easy. We'll make a little dashboard for that. You know, so it, that's the, those are the people that sell what you do the best. It's not me. I mean, I think I can sell it pretty good, but, you know, uh, but it's the customer that sells it better. You know, and, and there's a, a, especially in local government, when you're dealing with a lot, of, a lot of elected officials, there's even a little bit of competition there. You know, like, well, if the district clerk has it, the county clerk wants it, you know, so you, <laughs> you kind of work through that way. And that, that applies not just to GIS, but also uh, the app stuff we do. And the record stuff. Well, you, it, I, I, that is really, that's kind of the heart of what I was trying to get at is that that selling of the GIS value proposition you know that that is where the whole thing begins, and then mm-hmm. after that, you know, it kind of takes off and has a has a life of its own after that. But you got to keep rolling. That reminds me. So, you, I, in a, in addition to stalking your headline, I also went and looked at a recommendation. So, in LinkedIn bottom of LinkedIn profile, you have recommendations from people who've done business with. And so, there's a fellow that is uh, named Donnie Barstow. Who who is that? Barstow is that the right word? That's the right yeah, name. That's right. right. That's right. And he, he gave this recommendation, and I, I don't want you to blush or anything. This is a good recommendation. <laughs> but I want to focus on the sentence at the end. So listen for that sentence at the end. It says, Tim is an ideal client. He is smart and positive in his approach to everything and truly understands the concept of leadership. I would also add thought leader if I were to, to label Tim. His peers care about what he's doing and where he's headed because it is always the right direction. And I think he was that was kind of a – a funny plan words there, considering you're a GIS guy. But I, but I found it really fascinating that he perceived that in your organization, that your peers cared about what you were doing. Right. And I, and I think that to me, that that's indicative of someone who really you you have to you don't just get that from no, from nothing. You don't you don't right. get your peers to care about what you're doing out of nothing. And I and I think. You know, and I wanted to kind of turn that or, or the inverse of that statement. You know, I think that if it, it's perceived that people care about what we do, it's because we care about them. You know, and, and I remember this great quote from Jack, Jack Dangerman of Esri. And he would say, don't be interesting, be interested, which means focus on your client, focus on the people you're working with and be interested in what they're doing. And once you're there and once they see that you're an ally, uh, and you're advocating on their behalf, then work just flows freely. Like you, there's not the bureaucracy goes away, right? The the change orders, the paperwork, the memos, the phone calls, it just becomes free flowing. And I think the result seems like people are interested in what I'm doing, but it's mostly we're interested in them, and that's how this the 
know, this collaboration gets started and right. it continues. Do you consider yourself a leader and a mentor? Yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, part of it's like I said, I've been around forever, so that's part of it. But no, I, I, I learned a long time ago. Uh, so when I was the only person in GIS unboxing all that stuff, you know, I was, you know, technically the manager, but really I was the technician, right? I was the analyst. And it was my chief cook and bottle washer, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and my my boss at the time. He kind of he, he kind of said it straight. He goes, Tim, at some point in your career, you're either going to have to be a manager or you're going to have to be an analyst. You can't be both. I'm like, of course, I could be both. I'm both right now. But he was <laughs> right. Now he's yeah. right. You can't you can't really commit to both equally. You have to make a decision. And so right then, when I when it finally dawned on me that 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 was a, an important statement and that I probably was going to take the management vector. Uh, I knew that I would have to hire people a lot smarter than me. And that's really been my goal is to bring in folks that are way better at this stuff than I ever was, because it only makes it better. You know, I think we were joking a little bit yesterday, you know, uh, I often hear that, Oh, you know, Oh, you're overqualified. You know, if somebody came to my, you know, if somebody appeared to be overqualified for a position we had, I would hire them immediately because, I want it. I want that full experience that they have. You know, we we've had PhDs that would have been interns for us, and I'm totally okay with that. You know, because they chose to kind of work for Collin County, so they made the decision, right? I didn't go recruit them; they came to me, and then we we ended up hiring them, and they have a lot of experience that we could benefit from. So we have all kinds of you know interns, you know, uh, types of interns that we've had. But it, anyway, what the point I'm trying to make is. It, it, you know, I I always try to hire smart people, and 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 these days everybody's smarter than I am, so it, it's it's pretty easy. But uh, <laughs> but it's I, it, you know, but it's hard if you're new to management, right? If you're new to management, it's hard to let go of well, you know, I do it this way. You know, at some point you really have to make a clean break and go. You hired smart people to do this job. Let them do their job. They're yeah. good at it. Yeah, they are. That, and that's a. I think that's the the hallmark of a good leader. I Mike just commented. He said he liked the the interested rather than interested. Yeah. He Mike does that really well. Mike works with Critogen, and he talks to customers all the time about geospatial value. And that's one of the things I think he does really well is he's interested in in the customer, mm -hmm. not necessarily about telling the customer. So that's a good comment. Um, now, I, just, I want to take a step back and just say, you know, if you're watching, I, I'm grateful that Mike, you know, uh, had that little comment there. But I have a question. If you have a zinger, you think if you think you, <laughs> if you think you can stump Tim either about um, municipal GIS or about uh, his leadership and mentorship roles that he plays, um, then go ahead and, and hit us up because I'm sure he'll be willing to talk to you about that. I, I do want to ask quickly, what, what made you decide that you wanted to kind of put your stake in the ground in, in LinkedIn. Um, I, I know that you're also active in ERISA. I know that. And, uh, and you do a lot of things there, but, but you are one of the, one of maybe top 20 ish um, GIS type of people on LinkedIn. What made you decide you wanted to do that? Well, I, I felt that, uh, you know, it lended itself for it. You know, I mean, it was for me, I looked at LinkedIn and, and Twitter uh, as research tools. You know, so when I go out and look for things, uh, you know, I was, you know, that's how I found you. Right? I mean, it's who else is doing this kind of GIS? And then you start following and you kind of build that network. And then now you're starting to get, you know, at some point, there's like a tipping point where you get suddenly all of this information feeding to you. And then I, I spend a lot of my time just responding to it. So to me, you know, it's, it's been a great research tool and it's been a great platform to kind of share, you know, some of the work we've been doing. I mean, that's a lot of, you know. Oh, I think information. So and get responses from others. Okay. I lost you there for a minute, but I think we okay. that's okay. So I, I'm going to take this moment in time to make an announcement. And so um, next Thursday, I think it's the 24th in the evening, um, we're doing an experiment. Tim and I and Juliana mcmillan Wilhoyt and Kendrick Faison are going to co-host a clubhouse room on geospatial topics. 
and I hope that if you have a clubhouse, if you're if you're on Clubhouse, um, if you'll put down in your in your calendar somewhere to join us in that room, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern time um, on. Or did I say seven? I'm sorry. I said 7 p.m. Eastern time. That's what I said. 7 p.m. Eastern time, Thursday the 24th. Go to Clubhouse and find us there. We're gonna we're we're kind of experimenting with that platform as a way of um, sharing information about geospatial topics. Um, I want to ask you also about you you had you have a presentation on LinkedIn that you published on LinkedIn, and uh, I think it was called "Embrace the Fail," mm -hmm. and I. One of the things that you've been able to do, it seems like to me, is inspire people to do do things in a different way or to step out, like maybe maybe beyond their comfort zone. Is that what Embrace the Fail is all about? Tell me, tell me what that presentation was for, and why why you're passionate about it. Well, all right. So uh, so that kind of comes from my you know more recent agile background, where they want to create a safe space where failure is okay, and that's not always the case. In government, right? It's not always the case, you know, because they expect you to know everything that you need to know and don't waste the taxpayers' money experimenting with things. But the reality is that's that's the best way to learn. You know, uh, you have to fail at something so you know what not to do. And the best example I saw was uh, by uh, Linda Rising. She gave a talk, and you know, she's an agile thought leader, and her, she had a slide that had a baby on its stomach, a baby sitting up, and a baby walking. And he goes, you would never yell at your child as they learn to walk. You encourage, right? And they will fail a thousand times before they start walking. You know, we need to be like that in, in our business too, right? Encourage these little experiments that didn't work because now we know. I mean, I even heard like, like did it take 10,000 tries before Edison got the right light bulb or the light filament for the light bulb, right? I mean, so you know, it, you, you eventually get it, but the best way to learn, I think, is to fail. And if we all take on, you know, it's, it's a cultural shift for us. If we if it, we make a safe place for us to fail, then uh, then I think we succeed faster. Yeah. Uh, and But if we're always looking over our shoulder and trying to cover our business, um, you know, we, we choose not to be risky and we choose not to do those innovation things because we might fail. And therefore, we, we kind of live in mediocrity. So for us, I always say, do the experiment, try it. If it doesn't work, we've learned from it. We, you know, we, we talked a little bit about this yesterday. You, you kind of have to make your own space to fail. You, yeah. I, I don't think you can get in an organization and expect the organization to say, hey, you know, whatever you want to do, you fail, you go right ahead. It's okay with us. You know, I think you have to set your expectations. You have to say, look, I haven't tried this before. I'm willing to go out there and do this. I, you know, I may not get it right the first time, but by golly, I'm going to stick with it until I get it right. Right. So you kind of have to make your own space to fail and expectation management is a huge part of that. I think you're right. And I think if you have that conversation early, like, hey, I'm going to, you know, whether it's management or your customer, whoever it is that you that you're going to do this experiment with or for. Then you, uh, you know, you got to let them know. Right. You got to have this kind of negotiated. Hey, I'm going to try this. Like when we became agile, I was going to try agile and see how it goes. You know, agile is more of a mindset than a thing. But, uh, you know, but, you know, once you say it like that, then you do kind of create the space that allows allows failure to happen or know that it's not going to be perfect the first time. And part, of being, and part of being agile is just improve the next time, right? Just keep continuous improvement. You know, you'll never hit perfection, but you can always strive for it. And, uh, and that's kind of how... And failing is part of that. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. When you, I haven't thought about agile as a as organized failure, right? And I'm, I'm as we're talking about, I'm thinking, well, the ag whole agile methodology is about, well, let's show you what I've got, and then you tell me where it doesn't quite fit the bill, mm -hmm. and I'll go back and I'll tweak it and I'll come back, oh. and you sh and then and you show me where it doesn't quite fit the bill. So it's kind of almost organized failure. Um, right. uh, Sarah, thanks for your comment. You know. Uh, Missing small victories, you know, small scale victories is where we all win. That's that's where winning really takes place. The large scale things happen very rarely, in my opinion. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the small scale victories that that happen that take us to want to go. And it, heck, if we are focusing on failure, we're going to miss those small things, and then we're going to miss the whole the whole the whole nut there. Um, I wanted to put this up 
I thought this was funny. Nick Popovich, I'm sure you know Nick. He's an Ezra account rep. Nick says that Tim's frozen like this. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for, for that. Hey, uh, one more thing before I let you go today. I wanted mm -hmm. to ask, because I don't, I'm not, I was supposed to be on one of your um, presentations you did on personal Kanban. Yeah. Right? And I didn't get there for some reason. It really makes me mad. But it, you embraced that as a way of, of organizing yourself and you know, organizing your efforts. I would love to hear just a little bit about your thoughts about personal Kanban. Why Why is that attractive to you? Why do you think it makes sense? All right, so I'll, I'll try to make this a real snappy, guys. Maybe describe it for those who don't know it. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I will. All right, so, so you know, I always start off, a per, I, I've been doing some personal Kanban presentations a lot, so you'll be able to catch another one. I'll do another one for sure. And you can look on, um, you, can, you can look on Tim's profile on LinkedIn, and some of those presentations are recorded uh, right. in, there's activities there. So look for that if you if you want to look for what it is. So what I tell folks is if you have more than one thing to do, which we all do, whether that's personal or, uh, or, or professional, then you can use personal Kanban. And what it is is just a way to, to manage your to-do list might be the easiest way to look at this. So if you have a to-do list, uh, it's kind of linear, right? You've got to write it down. So sometimes the thing that's Fourth on your list becomes the highest priority that day, and you have drawing arrows and all that kind of stuff. Well, if you if you make it spatial, right? If you put that to do list on a board that basically has what options you're going to work on, what you're doing, and and done, and you just kind of move work as you complete it through, you actually get a dopamine hit when you finish something. Okay, uh, and it, it it feels good. You know, it really feels good to complete uh, even the smallest of tasks. And it's almost um, addictive, you know, we're like, I want, I want to feel that again. So I'm going to do another task and I'm going to have it go through this value stream to, from options to, to uh, doing to, to complete. Uh, and then you'll, you'll find that you're getting a lot of work done because you feel good about doing the work, you know? So I don't want to get too spiritual here, but it, it, it's really your brain it, it, it works well with what your brain wants and it wants you to complete things. And if you create tasks small enough that you can complete multiple in a day, then you'll really feel good about what you achieve that day. Yeah. And so it gets a lot deeper, but if you could just simply take, you know, and I use sticky notes, right? If you just make three columns and name them options to do and done or options doing and done, and then put all of the stuff that you're working on and I mean, any, just dump it out of your brain onto cards. And then you'll, you'll start to see patterns emerge. Like, Oh, these are related to, you know, like in your case, Bruce, maybe the, uh, the, the live, the, the live stream we're doing here, this is, might be related to my client. This might be related to, you know, my kids violin classes, you know, all of that can believe, I mean, that's what you do. That's your life. And you can put all your life out on this board where you can kind of see movement. And what's nice about it, if you have it exposed at work, if you're working in an office, if your boss or someone walks by, they go, hey, Tim, I need you to work on this. Well, you can just look back at the board behind you and go, well, what about that stuff that you told me to work on earlier today or yesterday? You don't have to be mean about it, but it, it becomes something visual that they can now see like, oh, yeah, yeah, do those things first and, and, and put this in your options. And then you start having the same, the nomenclatures out there and the options, you know, uh, where it, it almost becomes like a, a visual contract. You know, if Bruce, if you came to me, if you were my boss and said, Tim, I need you to work it, I'd write it down on a card and just show it to you. Go, is this what you want me to do? You nod your head, and then I would put it on my board. And once it's on the board, then we know it's going to be done. Too so, often so, we're told to do something, we forget, or we didn't write it down. This is a way to kind of get into that habit. Good. I want to pull that thread on office politics because I think it's important. But, <laughs> but so don't let me forget that. But I think okay. it's interesting. You're talking about how you get a dopamine hit for from it. Mm -hmm. You know, really what you're doing is you're you're taking things out of the out of you know we can do spiritual here. You're taking them out of your out of your mind, and who knows where that mind is? You're taking right. it out of the mind, and you're putting that in some spatial formation, like on a wall or on a mm -hmm. table, or something where you can move things around as concrete items. It changes the way fundamentally changes the way you deal with each of these items. Right. 
you know, and the, the office politics of it, for heaven's sake, if I've got a wall full of these sticky notes and they've all got the tasks of things that people ask me to do, you know, that's a physical representation of something that you committed to. And that has got to be, uh, as a like as a manager, if you walk past someone's office that had that, that's going to give you a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling that they're no, they know what they're doing and they're doing something right. that meets your needs, right? Yeah. <laughs> And if you and if your done column starts to fill up, you know, not only do you feel good about it, but whoever is, you know, you're working with is like, wow, look at all that work that Tim's getting done now. No, I like you know, the idea. Maybe for every ten sticky notes you get over there, you can buy yourself a pack of M and M's. <laughs> that's good. I like uh, that. That's motivating for me, anyway. So, <laughs> so look, I, you know, I one of the things I'm getting from this conversation I, that I really like is that you know, as an influencer in in this. Well, let's just go back. Your job is you're working, you work as an applications manager for a county mm -hmm. and you, you take GIS and records management and, uh, and application development. You put it all together into one job, but you've also been able to extract yourself from that and say, hey, I've gained a lot of experience over the years mm -hmm. and put that out for other people to help other people. I think that's just fan fantastic. It's really, it really makes me admire you because you don't have to do that. Right. You don't it's have the favorite. You're it's my, get, it's the, go ahead. I'm sorry. You're going to get paid the same if right, you set right. up shop office in Collin County, or if you went to URISA meeting, you're going to get paid the same no matter what. Mm -hmm. It's the favorite part of my job now. I mean, you know, like it or not, I'm wise because just I've been around so long, you know, so I, I love sharing some of that wisdom. Uh, just things that like, and I don't even regret like, man, I wish I knew personal Kanban 15 years ago. It doesn't matter. I've learned it now and it's helping me now, uh, you know, so then I can just share it with others. And if it helps them, you know, great. You know, when I go, you know, we're talking about me blending all of my department, you know, all my teams together. I, my job is just to sell the team. I'm not doing any work anymore. The teams do all the work, right? They're the smart ones that get things done. It's my job to help. I think what, what you need, we can help. you. Yeah. And, and it's just, you know, I, I feel like I'm a more of a diplomat, uh, you know, than I am a, a you know a manager. You know, it's just kind of getting out there and and, and just getting to, to know the business and how we can help them uh, you know solve some of their hard problems. Well, you're making a difference in Collin County and beyond Collin <laughs> County. And I actually I was going to show this comment. Sarah, Sarah, she she saw that presentation and started using Kanban <laughs> because of it. So so you probably don't know Sarah. Maybe you do. I don't know. It but, looks, her name looks familiar. Yes, but I. You know that that's so that's such a tangible thing of saying you know this one this thing I did has helped somebody in in their daily life and that that's got to be very gratifying. So I just want to I want to give you kudos, you know, and, oh, and you're doing a great job, and I'm I'm glad that you and I connected this way, and hopefully we mm -hmm. can stay connected through the oh, years, sure. and you and I can do similar things. We can help people to do their jobs better. We can help, you know, we can help disseminate the idea that location mm -hmm. matters for one. Right. And then we can also just, you know, do do things to help people, other people to get their job done better. What yeah. We love to do. Yeah, absolutely. Any last words of wisdom or anything you want to lay out <laughs> before we go today? Well, I, I said it a couple of times here, and, and, and this is something that's really changed, you know, my life, even in my later years, is it's OK to try new things. Right. It's OK to experiment, you know, uh, to to just try it, you know, uh, and. And you can do it in small doses, right? It doesn't have to be these big, bold failures. Like like today, right? The, the Mars landing. We can't, you can't just try that, right? I mean, that's one of those times where failure is not an option, really. But for most of us, it is, right? Failure, we can, you know, we can try little things. We can even do these things privately. Uh, but you still need to try because you, that, that, to me, is the quickest way to improve. And as long as you're improving each and every day, then, you know, you can't be disappointed with the way things are going. No, that's good. That's good advice. And I just, I'm going to piggyback on what you said, though. You know, that in terms of the perseverance, I, I was watching a thing a couple of days ago about the design of the rover, right? And that they mm -hmm. went over and over and tried all kinds of different things until they got right. the desired result. So, so really what we're seeing today with perseverance is perfection, right? It has to be absolutely perfect to do its job in the situation that they're asking it to do. But it didn't start out as perfection. It started out as a series of iterations and failures 
until you got to a place where you can put the stake in the ground and say, okay, now we're ready for perfection. Mm -hmm. So I think we should all kind of live our lives that same way. <laughs> Very good. Bruce. All right, my friend. Uh, it's good to have you on and uh, hopefully we can catch up again soon. And we'll, we'll talk next week, right in clubhouse. Next Thursday, 7 PM Eastern time on clubhouse. If you have an invitation, if you don't, let me know because I have an extra one and I'm dying. I to do too. I've got some invite. Next one. So let us know. And if you're a geospatial professional, you want to try Clubhouse and see what it can offer you. We're experimenting just to see how what, if it makes things better for everybody. So 7 p.m. next Thursday night. And then this live stream happens every Thursday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific time. You can do the math for the two time zones in the middle. And uh, and and we, we have interesting guests every week. And if you could tell your friends about it and invite people, it would be great to to continue to grow the audience. And uh, and I just want to thank Tim for being such a great guest. And we'll talk to you soon. Okay, my friend. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. See ya.